The following podcast is an Embassy Row production. Drum roll, please. God, I'm so bad at drum rolling. Um, <laughs> welcome to the Shaken and Stand Show. I'm Nigel Barker in New York, and I'm here with my co-host Tom Astor in Oxford. How are you, Tom? Uh, well, nice, thanks. Yeah, really well. Just, just um, it's a June evening. I've just got in, and it's I'm um, cold. It's one of those June damp. You know, I've been at a cricket and I'm watching my son play cricket for the last couple of hours, and it's just you know a little bit of drizzle, a little bit of this, and a little bit of that. English, typical English kind of. You know, chilled weather. But um, yeah, no. Other than that, everything's everything's great. You know, people Can't... over here really do not understand cricket. But I think of all the English sports that there are, cricket has to be the number one misunderstood sport in the U.S. They just have no I, idea. Probably the most civilized game in the world. I'm not calling it. It's a is maybe snooker's less civilized, but it's, I don't know. Let's play in a dark room, so maybe not. <laughs> Playing with yeah. your balls in a dark room, Tom, is rarely civilised. Um, but cricket, on the other hand, um, where you have a hot red ball, very fast moving, uh, but it's a very slow game. No, it takes forever. It can do. I was just saying, Anne Marie, um, uh, when we produced the, the, um, the, the, the can, you can, you get a test match, it can take four days. One game can take four days. Anne Marie asked me. Um, Anne Marie, our producer, he's talking Anna about Anna everyone Marie. out there. Then asked me rather sweetly whether whether that meant that what well, did they play through the night? Did they actually go to sleep? <laughs> yes, as I said, it is probably the most misunderstood game yeah. in America. People literally have no idea what people are doing. They assume people are all getting drunk, drinking pims, and then at the same time having cucumber sandwiches as a, some sort of refreshment, which in exactly. itself sounds ridiculous. Um, exactly. I've just been doing exactly. No, exactly. So there you go. But guys, you know, before we move on, we've got a great, great guest today. What are you drinking, Tommy boy? Oh, well, because I got a little chill, I came in and I made myself a bull shot. It's, I basically, beef consomme, good old Baxter's soup. You know, there it is. Look at that. Oh, God, that's disgusting. It's so good. You know, boiled beef bones, um, warmed up with a splash of vodka. And tonight I'm putting this, this uh, added thing, this, this bullshot sauce, which is rather amazing. It's like chilies, um, hint of smoke, seriously hot, spicy sauce. So it's a bit like it's a bit like Worcestershire sauce, or however you Americans call it. Um, it's a bit like Worcester sauce, but it's with a kick. Bit of that in it, and you know what? The chill's gone. The drink's warm. I mean, Basically, you are able to turn just about anything into a cocktail, even if it's sort well, of beef consomme soup is somehow turned into a cocktail with a shot of vodka. So there you go, people. Next time you get cold and you want to have your cocktail and your dinner, simply drop the vodka in your soup and you're exactly. good to go. Two in one. Cheers. My goodness. Well, I've gone the opposite way because it's a lovely, balmy evening here in New York and uh, it's, the sun is shining. It's over 70 degrees right now. So I decided to make myself, because, you know, watermelons are in season, a watermelon margarita, no less. Oh. And in fact, I took it a step further. I actually, I guess, what do you call it? I blended a whole bunch of like two cups worth of, of uh, watermelon and added sugar and made my, my own watermelon simple syrup. And use that inside uh, this margarita, which has tequila. I, I actually used the Lost Sundays Blanco tequila, um, and I used about one and a half limes because they're a little small these these days for some reason, but absolutely delicious and juicy. Uh, half a ounce of the simple syrup, and then I poured in some of the actual, uh, you know, watermelon itself into the drink and kind of just shook it up. And here it is, no salt. Um, and a little water, watermelon cube on the side, and it's delicious. Cheers. Very refreshing. Mm. Chin, chin. Chin, chin, my friend. Boom. Um, booze news. Not the nine o'clock news, but booze news. Yeah, I've got one little snippet. I've the got richer, something, too. The richer you are, the more likely you are to drink success in this country. And generally, teen, late teens and 20s are drinking much less than they did um, 20 years ago and the 55s and over are drinking much more that's my news 
And uh, once again, you can see how entertaining Tom would be at the news. Basically, not a newscaster is now, Mr. Well, you know something? The thing is, I don't understand it because I look at this news, I look at the, the facts like this, and they're saying things like, you know, 18% of people over the age of 55 confess to drinking more than X amount of units per week. And then I look at, I can't work out what a unit is, and I look at a unit and I'm like, and so basically what they're saying is they drink, you know, 18% of adults in a bad way um, admit to drinking sort of half a bottle of wine a night at least five days a week. And I'm looking at it going, Jesus Christ, I mean, you know, doesn't that doesn't strike me as being, I don't know, maybe I've just come from a big drinking family, but that does not strike me as being very much. Well, <laughs> it's all relative, Tommy boy. Um, <laughs> And I have a little bit of booze news myself. I love the fact that you know it's all it's just it's just all boils down to uh, you know how much you can drink. The world's oldest single malt whiskey, Scotch, aged 80 years, is uh, set for release. Now, joining the chorus of rare whiskey satisfying top shelf palates, legendary bottler Gordon and McPhail announced an upcoming release. What will be the longest aged single malt scotch on the market? It's an 80 year old, uh, as I mentioned, um, produced by the Glenlivet Distillery. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story because in February 3rd, 1940, George Urquhart, I think I say, Urquhart, okay. and his dad. Okay. Urquhart. Is it Urquhart? There you go. On February 3rd, 1940, George Urquhart and his dad, John, sealed cask 340 with the intention that it would be enjoyed by future, future generations. Um, and uh, so, you know, he's apparently known as the father of single malt scotch. You probably knew that, Tom. I'm not a big scotch drinker. And, uh, you know, he's well known for saying the future is shaped by what you do today. Obviously, you know, putting whiskey in casks and then drinking it 10 years, 20 years later, whatever you do at that moment, you know, will be enjoyed for, for, you know, later on. Now, uh, this decanter, they're very, they, I guess he's producing out of this 250 bespoke decanters of this 80 year old whiskey. Uh, which is being designed by some great designer, apparently. And decanter number one will be auctioned off by Sotheby's at the, I guess, the end of the summer in September of this year. Now, they did something similar to this in 2016 um, with a 75-year-old Scotch, and the bottles went for approximately $28,000 each. So, if you'd like a basically $30,000 bottle of whiskey, just start saving because in September one can be yours, 80 years old. How about that? Yeah. Octogenarian. No, that's all well and good, but you know, there's a long tradition in these distilleries in Scotland of, um, you know, the, the makers like to add their little mark to these barrels occasionally. And I'm wondering if the father of the Scotch whiskey, you know, the modern Scotch whiskey, added his little mark. Haven't, you know, <laughs> you, know you know what I'm getting at? I'm hoping you're not talking about the uh, the little doggy who um, was sniffing the actual casks again. Might have done a little leak on the side, if that's what you're talking about. 28,000 quid for that? Whatever. Yeah, well, no wonder. I don't wonder I'm not a Scotch drinker. Anyway, we have a wonderful way, guest way, on today. By the way, sorry, let's just get that completely straight. There's absolutely no basis in what I just said at all. I just thought it'd be amusing. Because I swear... Tommy, Tommy, there's no basis on anything that you ever say. I mean, it's it's all okay. codswallop, and we know it. I love the idea of Urk pissing in the barrel going, oh, somebody bloody, bloody good by the time they get out to drink it. This is 86 years. They're going to love it. Some bastard's probably going to pee through the bloody nose. I wouldn't have a clue what he's drinking. Anyway, obviously that's not the case, but, you know, just throw that out there. And on that note, our guest today is an old friend of mine. Now, we first met at New York Fashion Week, I don't know how long ago. It's probably about 15 odd years ago. And I got to say, I was blown away by his brilliant collection. I literally remember sitting there in the front row as I was lucky enough to be sitting in the front row um, and just looking at the pieces come down the runway and thinking to myself, Oh, I'd wear that. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, I need to shoot that. And then I finally thought, well, who is this guy? And I sought him out. Now, he basically is known for a lot of different things. This is a man who's worn many different hats as, as, whilst I've known him. Not just is he an accomplished and acclaimed and award-winning fashion designer, and he has dressed the likes of the Sex Pistols. He's collaborated with stars like David Bowie. Um, but he's, in fact, a rock and roller himself. 
He's the lead singer of a band called Slinky Vagabond with an all-star ensemble and has a new album out called King Boy Vandals. Please welcome Keenan Dufty. Keenan, mate, how are you? <laughs> with that introduction, I, uh, I think I'll just go home now. Um, yeah, Slinky Vagabond, not to be confused with Stinky Vagabond. <laughs> Which was your previous band. <laughs> which was the previous band, yeah, which was my nickname at school. Um, yeah. There you go. So when you were sat in that front row, somebody came backstage and said, Nigel Barker's in the front row. And I was like, oh, you got to get him, bring him back after the show. And then, of course, we didn't connect there, but we connected at another point, uh, not so soon after, I think. But, yeah, thank you for enjoying the show. I think it's like Brits in New York got what I was trying to do, you know, which was very much a British street fashion thing. And, um, and that really helped, you know, it really helped to sort of get the word out, I think, because especially like 15, 20 years ago, tw more than 20 when I started in New York, people didn't really get that British uh, translation. You know, they, they sort of didn't really necessarily understand the Brit punk thing. Uh, Brit pop didn't really happen in America. So there was a bit That's of a disconnect. Sure. So, you know, it really helped having folks like you who kind of understood and could translate it to the, uh, our American cousins. Well, I, I want to get into all of that, but before we get there, what are you drinking? I am drinking. It's actually a berry cocktail. Delicious. And it's in a glass that my wife gave to me, which says anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance on the side. And they're the different <laughs> levels that you get to as you get through the cocktail, except for that probably won't happen with me because there's this is a mocktail, actually. So if, if that was alcohol, it would be the other way up. So it's anger obviously starts at the bottom, right? Uh, it's actually, it's, it's, um, it's defiance, anger, uh, rec bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance when you get to the bottom, that, that you are actually in trouble. <laughs> or passed out. Or yeah, passed or gone, out. under the table. Oh. <laughs> well, cheers, my friend. It's cheers. wonderful to have you on. We appreciate you. Cheers. Great to join you. I, I'd love the show. It's great. You guys are doing a fantastic job. And, um, it's, you know, you have some great guests and great conversations. It's wonderful. Oh, well, we're about to get into it with you now, Keenan. so beware. Um, Go you know, for it, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we want to know it all. We're going to pull it all back. But, Go um, on. You know, so you, you obviously you, you kind of jumped in there and, 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 you know, led on about the sort of Brit pop and, you know, the sort of punk rock kind of feel and vibe. And, you know, obviously with someone like yourself, you're a musician and you have a, obviously, you know, we, we mentioned you have a new album out and you're part of this great band as the lead singer. But with you, was it the music or the fashion that came first? It was totally music. You know, I kind of grew up watching Top of the Pops and, you know, seeing those great bands. And I'm a huge Bowie fan, but actually when I was a kid, I didn't really get Bowie. I kind of liked bands like The Sweet and, um, you know, Slade, the more kind of hit single bands that were on Top of the Pops. And then even things like La Belle, you know, Lady Marmalade, that was, they were actually very glam. You know, they were a very kind of glam presentation. And that really attracted me. So it was the clothes of those bands that I re was really into. I loved the music, but the clothes really excited me. And I'd see people like Brian Ferry, and he looked like he was, you know, from another planet. I mean, people, a lot of people say this about that era of music. And maybe you're, you're younger than me, so maybe, you know, you didn't experience it at that time. But um, it was wanting to be dressed like those artists. And I really loved the style and you know, just the glamour of it all. It was fantastic. And it was very out of reach until punk. And then punk sort of allowed you to slash the side of your, you know, flared pants and duct tape them together and have suddenly skinny pants and a ripped T-shirt and cut your own hair and have spiky hair and go out, you know, and express yourself, um, which is kind of dangerous growing up in Doncaster because that led to uh, one or two uh, long, speedy exits from venues, let's say. Um, but yeah, it was very much music and, and fashion. I, I wasn't really aware of fashion. I mean, I didn't, I remember going to interview at St. Martin's and pronouncing every designer's name wrong, you know, like Versace, Issy Miake. You know, it was like, I didn't know. I, I mean, I, I basically bought Vogue in the train station in, in Doncaster, got on the train, read it cover to cover, and then went into the interview and tried to sort of regurgitate what I read. And uh, I mean, it worked. I got in. So, <laughs> how did you get it? <laughs> Like, so just before you came on, we were, we were um, doing a thing called Booze News, and Nigel was doing, he, he, Nigel tends to do that on pretty much every podcast. He'll pick <laughs> some, like, French, a French word or something, and because he left school when he was 12 to become a model. Um, 
he, he just doesn't get the basics of the pronunciation. So he was trying to pronounce Urquhart, which is a pretty straightforward right. name, I would have said. Um, but you should, well, hopefully they won't edit it out. When you listen to this podcast, they'll keep it in because it's absolutely, it's too good. It's exactly what you've just been saying. You know? Tom, um, yes, yeah. edit mostly, almost everything that you say out, as you will <laughs> notice. Probably, otherwise we'll be sued. I just imagine that. So anyway. Well, it's uh, names like Sinjin and, and Chumley and, you know, I, 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 I I American... my mother's maiden name is Sinjin. Sinjin, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, you, know, you, oh. you sort of, I mean, it was famously mispronounced by um, Rowan Atkinson in Notting Hill, you know, as the vicar in Notting Hill, and he can't get anyone's names right. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I hear that all the time still, you know, living in New York, I hear all of these Leicester Square and those kind of pronunciations, yeah. which yeah. kind of Worst, tickle me, you know. Worcester Square. Source, exactly. Right. The source is the classic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was really, you know, the 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 kind of music thing that I really loved. And you know, I'm I'm sitting, it looks like I'm sitting in Strand Bookstore, but I'm sitting behind a bookshelf here that goes way up. And wow. um, you know, it's it's you have to go to the top, and in one section there are fashion books, and the rest of it is music, comics, James Bond novels. You know, my wife has a little section down the bottom here as well, which she keeps ribbing me about. <laughs> what did that say? Her section contains uh, uh, books of intellectual nature, like books uh, that you actually read. You know, I just uh, have books that I look at the pictures, like Nigel's books, for example. Like, like Nigel's. I was going to say that earlier. Perfect. Models of influence. Great pictures, you know. That, that's what all I'm about. Picture books, basically. And if they're <laughs> scratch and sniff, all the better. Um, <laughs> but, you, you know, so... The, so many top designers are inspired by music. I mean, there's no doubt that if you look at fashion throughout the ages, you know, the music industry is, you know, almost is the heartbeat of the street, right? It, it, it sort of acts as, you know, the, what's happening, the zeitgeist of the time is being fed, you know, through the musicians, through the bands, through the, whoever, whatever the music is at that moment. And so you, and you it sort of, Whatever that that vibe is, it brings it to life through music, and it's a, yeah. that's that's the very first translation, isn't it? Totally, yeah, totally. And it's what you know. When I started in college, I was making clothes for myself and my friends, and they were really like you know performance based. They weren't anything you would really wear in a day to day, you know, setting. I mean, I was I actually brought I brought a prop to show you here. Um, it, it, so this is this is from so. This is me in the, uh, the, the orange-haired Ziggy Stardust from Doncaster outfit. Uh, That's with, you. My good, with my good friend Dylan Jones here, who's much more somber in a uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier get-up. But, you know, this, in college, I was making stuff like that. I was in IB magazine in, like, 1985. And I was making stuff like that to, to you know, for my friends to wear, for myself to wear, because I was making music back then as well, you know, and, and sort of got a lucky break, got, found a manager, actually, when I was really young. Um, who was kind of pushing me and getting me to re make records and record for EMI and stuff like that. So the clothes were really for performance. I didn't connect that you have you might want to wear them in the street. So it was just a full <laughs> throttle. You know, it was kind of uh, as as provocative and as outrageous as you could be. And and I didn't think about making stuff for in a commercial setting at all, which I think is a great thing about going to school. That you know, a fashion school, you can express all that and actually have a chance to present it to the world. Because when you get into society and, you know, you have boring stuff like mortgages and car payments and all that kind of stuff to take care of, you, you have to think a bit more commercially, you know, so maybe it gets tamed a little bit. And it's a great time to express it in college. It's, really yeah, it's good. so funny. You and I have so much in common in so many unusual ways. However, we're also completely different, right? So it's like yeah. I... You know, you mentioned those bands, you know, you said, well, I might not have been involved, have been in, as inspired by them. But actually, on the contrary, I, my favorite bands, my one of my very first albums I ever bought on vinyl was David Bowie. Right. So, right, right. you know, and, you know, and I Mark Bolan and T-Rex, I had a huge poster on my wall, you know, with him playing his guitar. And, you know, and that, that was my one of my favorite albums ever, even to this day still is. Yeah. So, yeah. And I've always had as well seen glam rock and that kind of just over the top expressiveness that you would see 
uh, in rock and roll at that at that time as being something just so outrageous, so crazy. I mean, Led Zeppelin, obviously, as well, sure. with the big hair, the tight jeans, yeah. and all the rest of it, had a, a big part of that. They weren't as camp, perhaps, or as out there from from a fashion perspective as people right. like Bowie. Um, but you also mentioned these bands like Slade, who were the sort of commercial, as you said, they're sort of one hit wonders type of band. But I mean, I, as soon as you said Slade, it put a smile on my face though. <laughs> it, it was kind of happy music. I mean, it was sort of drunken, happy, yeah. kind of crazy, you know, you could sort of scream it at a pub kind of music. Totally, yeah. I mean, Slade, I always, when I listen back to them, there's a double track echo. So Noddy Holder's got that kind of John Lennon thing going on. And the piano, uh, you know, descending chords and everything is very much like the Beatles, like like a kind of Lennon era Beatles, but with that stompy terrace thing, you know, the football thing going on. So kids would sing it on a Saturday afternoon at a football match. Um, right. I never went to football because I lived in Doncaster and they had the worst team in the world when I was a kid. So going to football wasn't really a thing for, for me so much. But yeah, I mean, I think it's like a lot of us from a particular era. You know, you mentioned things we have in common. You and I are born a day apart. And, and Chrissy and my wife are born a day apart, not the same year, the same dates. Uh, so there, there's a lot we have in common, not just the fashion stuff and the music, and, but like, you know, kind of mystical stuff, like when you're born and all that kind of thing. No, no, it, it's unusual. It's, it's, it's funny, too, because I studied fashion design, uh, pattern cutting and tailoring at my high school, Bryanston, that Tom and I went to school at. And um, our boarding school. And that, that was actually a big interest of mine as well. And it's something that I did. But it was but unlike you, who was doing the sort of punk rock and kind of super cool stuff, I was doing stuff that was actually quite commercial, funnily right. enough. And so, and I actually ended up creating a hat that I sold on the high street in a in a store called General Trading Company when I was eighteen oh, yeah. I through my brother. Right? right. So, and so my whole approach was far more commercial than yours was at at, at that young age, um, and, and what I was looking to try and complete. So it's it's funny, and and also too going back to Sex Pistols. I believe Malcolm McLaren, wasn't he the, the uh, manager of the Sex Pistols? Yeah, yeah. But he was also my mother's manager. When my mother was a singer. Right. right. So there's another, just a, a degree of separation where you dressed the Sex Pistols and my mum, it, it was her manager. So Fantastic. I, well, there's a little, there's, there's, it's funny how the world is and how yeah. often there's just a little bit of separation between people and who they know and what they know. But again, you know, I've, I've always personally... Music just plays a massive part. I mean, Tom's a huge, big musician and loves to have mus musicians at his house and entertain mm. musicians and be performed in bands and, in fact, help write and perform the music for this show that we or when we first launched it. Uh, yes. And it's a big, it's a big part of everything. Why do you think? I mean, what, what's your take on the sort of how music is the storytelling of the time? Like how it becomes that. Well, you know, how does it evolve? You know, how do, what do you think it really creates that moment that 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 sort of jump from what's happening right here to the sounds that we hear and, and the fact that that's what historically has been the case? I think it just it it does exactly that. It reflects in a in a broader sense what's happening in in youth culture, and um, you know, whether it's whether it's beats, whether it's a chord chord sequences, whether it's riffs, whatever it is, whether it's a vocal melody line, whether it's a style of music, it encapsulates that time. Um, you know, nothing sort of has done that better than move, you know, movements like Acid House, for example, which, uh, you know, rave culture was a kind of different interpretation in the US. But in the UK, um, that sort of codified and brought together all of these kids from very different uh, places. So, you know, you've got the football hooligans, raving with, you know, kids from art school, raving with uh, people from bands that would go to, you know, these sort of M25 circular weekend illegal raves. And it was fueled actually as well by ecstasy. You know, there was the explosion of ecstasy. So when you look at music through the ages, there's, there's a parallel of drug culture. There's a parallel of what people wear, how they express themselves through fashion although they don't necessarily consider it fashion because they don't want to be part of the mainstream per se. And then the, the music soundtracks it. Um, and I think, you know, you mentioned Led Zeppelin. It's a great example. They never let their music be used in commercials and they didn't really release singles. And yet, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up with that whole lot of love instrumental on top of the pops. I, I, for years, I didn't know it was Led Zeppelin. You know, it, it was a total disconnect to me, but that was the where 
the the sort of it, it touches the contemporary nerve, you know, is is through um, music connecting in a broader sense. And I think it, it's that's what it's really made for. People say today, you know, music isn't what it used to be because the industry has been destroyed by streaming and all of that. But if you talk to a 18, 90 year old, 20 year old today, they're just as into music and they're looking for what's happening in the underground. They're looking for what's happening in the commercial space, um, just as much as kids were in you know, the 70s and 80s and 90s, yep. like when hip hop exploded, for example. The thing is, as you said, you know, the kind of ecstasy rave culture and everything. My problem, I was in the car earlier on with my 18 year old son, and I think, you know, it's, it, it's high time we change the current drug of fucking choice because it's, <laughs> it strikes me that they're all smoking too much of the super fucking strength weed. And the music is, is, is I mean, I'm a musician, but Drill music, drill. I don't know. You know what? It's just like I want kids sitting in the car listening to this stuff. I'm just like, they all literally sound like it. It was done up. I had a massive job. And she just could barely be bothered to get the words out, let alone kind of like making these. I mean, it's just kind of like, I, you know, I'm, I sit there thinking, we, you know, am I turning it to my parents? You know, is this what old people do? But I'm, I'm like thinking, no. You know, literally, let's get, get let's get some new drugs um, on the market and try and change the change the uh, thing. I don't know. That's anyway. Sorry, I just, I just had this. What you were saying, I had this this morning. It's the very same thing. It's like you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good observation, Tom. Actually, I think it's I think it's the perfect observation. You know, and you know, in, in when I'm teaching, I, t- I teach uh, fashion students, and I always give that analogy of you know because they they want to know. Um, they want to know about the history of, of, of the waves of fashion in the late 20th century, early, early, 20, early 21st. And I always say, you look at, look at what's happening in uh, drug culture at that time, because it often fuels creativity. You know, the Halston documentary that was on Netflix recently, you see how Studio 54 and Halston, a lot of the uh, music artists, um, a lot of the designers and models at that time were fueled by cocaine, you know, and um, and I'm not, you know, saying everybody go and do cocaine or everybody go and do ecstasy. That's not my point. But it does actually influence creatives in a way. Um, and I think the other good point you make as well is the disconnect. I, I do think I'm too old because I, a, a lot of music that exists today, like there's this band called Working Men's Club. I really, really like them. They're like a dance music act. And But when I listen to them, I can hear all the influences and so it's sort of, it is new, but it's not new to me, you know, because I kind of go, oh, it's a bit of this and a bit of that. And I didn't really notice that with a band like Roxy Music, you know, because I, I, I didn't know the influences. I didn't know, um, really know r and B. I I didn't really know blues. I didn't really know Stock, Stockhausen or, you know, any of those things that came together. But as you get older, you get more informed. And, um, and I think that does tend to remove you a little bit from actually being able to enjoy contemporary stuff because you kind of see you can kind of see behind the curtain a little bit clearly no that's actually a very interesting point because yeah likewise i'm listening to music with my with my daughter and i'm thinking oh that's i, I know i recognize that that little lyric that little sound that little noise that little piece that some producers picked it from here pulled it from there and i even thought sort of had brainwaves i'm like oh my goodness what about this song they should pull and my my, my daughter's like yeah, I've actually never heard that sound before. And, right. and I'm like, yeah, and, and I'm sort of thinking, I'm waiting, who's going to take that sound next from some old song and pop it into some new hip hop song or something and use that you know, little beat and what have you and, and make yeah. sense of it. No, it's it's kind of... Uh, Kind of extraordinary what what can happen you know with music and, and, where, and where you know where it starts where it ends up and there's all kinds of obviously right now a lot of a lot of legal cases with people you know asking who who ripped off who uh and who stole whose music right yeah i mean there's there's that whole you know the issue of appropriation and led zeppelin faced this with you know riffs from willie dixon and so on that at the time weren't credited and even the beatles come together you know um uh they kind of had to settle with chuck berry for the the lyrical section that John Lennon just kind of purloined, um, I don't think it, I don't think it was conscious. I think at that time, bands like the Stones and Pretty Things were really loving uh, a music that had you know rhythm and blues had kind of and, and the blues had faded away. You know, you you go to Chess Records in in the sixties uh, as the Rolling Stones did, and Muddy Waters was painting the studio. You know, it was like that's how he was making his living. He was kind of almost forgotten at that point. He was then rediscovered because all of these young, oiky British bands started 
playing his music and you know it came back to the forefront and it's the same with you know that hip hop when it launched really when it happened in start of probably in the 80s let's say i mean it started much earlier but you had all of those james brown funky drummer you know loops and james brown's yelp and they were put on so many records but i mean i have to say at that time i mean james brown wasn't forgotten but he was doing living in america you know it wasn't like the classic papa's got a brand new bag and it's a man's 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 world that was sort of very much of a different era and i think it it reinvigorated his career um and i think everybody has influences and you know we're we're sort of dangerous in this culture where everybody's sort of crying appropriation all the time over everything because you are naturally influenced by your surroundings um you know fashion is like that it's very much uh if you look at the history of fashion it's been influenced culturally it's been influenced uh through different subcultures and you know th- there there is an there is a very strong argument for crediting where your influences come from but i think it, you shouldn't not be influenced because you may be afraid that you're going to be called out as appropriating you know i think that's But is that uh, that's not going to happen though? Because you know, by the time you're doing it, you're not even aware that you're doing it. How many songs have the same chord sequences? That there are, you know, there are so many. Yeah, so many. I mean, there's there's you know, there's a finite number of kind of characters, you know, characters characterizations you can kind of do and and, yeah. and interpretations on, as you say. I mean, I think that I think with that kind of Led Zeppelin thing, that's just like well. I think that's a little bit. Isn't that touch slightly touch of the old dare I say it sour grapes and like you know. Like, but they may well have had, instead of sitting there going, you know, I mean, what what happened to that phrase, um, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery? Yeah. Well, we'll, yeah. Let's go with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, even if, <laughs> when you, li- you listen to the Sex Pistols, you know, and submission is, you know, it's the kinks, it's the doors. That riff is, is you know, hello, I love you. Um, you know, and, and, and they, I don't think, consciously stole that, but it was definitely an influence. Of course. And, you know, I, I, and knowing some of those guys, I know where some of their influences came from. Some are very blatant, and others are more sort of uh, subdued. But they wore their influences, and, and Oasis are a classic for that. You know, Oasis um, they took T Rex and literally took the riff. You know, and they didn't try and hide it. They just went, "Whoa, T Rex, let's do that." You know, so there's a very strong argument for just wearing your influences on your sleeve. You know, and I, and Malcolm used to say that. Malcolm McLaren used to say that all the time. You know about plagiarism is is I mean in the context that he was saying it it was kind of like this taking ideas from different disparate areas and mashing them together and making a kind of new thing out of it which I yes, think is important to do that it's happening all the time it's like it's like I think you know it's quite amusing to see the kind of philharmonic orchestra taking on the Beatles you know <laughs> And blaming George Mike and George Martin for like you know because of his knowledge of classical music and putting all those those um you know arrangements in that Beatles music this classical musician you know yeah. really was oh, of course everything everything's on and on and on you know that's how that's how the world goes around and then, and yeah 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 imitation but you do yeah. get but that being said <clears throat> you know there are bands right which we can all sort of list and we've actually mentioned several of them today like right? whether it's you know Roxy music or say T-Rex, for example, where the sound that came out of those bands seemed incredibly unique at the time, right? They, yeah. for whatever it is, like even if there was influences coming out of them, there was something that was just very special to that band, and and really no one's ever, so they, and they, they they still sort of stand alone to some extent. Like no one sure. really kind of maybe it's the artist's voice or even Dylan, even just singing the way he sang, just his his sound of of Dylan, it was sort of a unique, you know. Uh, That's well, something Guthrie, too. I mean, Woody Guthrie. I mean, you know, unashamedly, Woody Guthrie in the in the beginning, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, you said something keen earlier on about um, you know, you're saying the knives that you're quite similar in many ways, and I was, and it made me think that this is perfect. Um, I'm going to use Nigel's favorite word, which is a segue. It's not. It's, I, to, to me, it's a little bit like moist. It's not a very nice word, but anyway, um, you said earlier that you were, you know, you're quite similar, and I was thinking. You know, Nigel was busy insulting me the other day on one of these podcasts. He said he, he said he thought he thought I looked like Mugatu. I mean, you're Hansel, I'm Mugatu. He's Derek. We could do a whole Zoolander on on music, right? We could kind of do a whole Zoolander four or wherever we go to. <laughs> okay, music. 
<laughs> so the house is going to work. I'm going to be smoking the weed. You're going to be doing the cocaine, and Dufty's going to be doing the ecstasy. I can see it now. <laughs> We've got it all going on, people. <laughs> so talking about, well, you talked about you talked about earlier on. You talked about how you know the drug culture influenced music, and it, that often also influenced fashion and, and and you know just art itself in many ways, right? Yeah. Is it possible to really produce successful art without various sort of influences, if you like? Oh like yeah, yeah. Uh, and and drugs. Like who are we? Who 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 out there from a music standpoint is a sort of super successful sober musician, for example? I think. I mean, there are a lot of them. You know, there there are a lot of them. Um, I don't, I think actually. You know, getting high and getting inebriated does isn't good for that creative process for most people. And I think when you speak to you know this major successful musicians, they all say the same thing. Maybe apart from Keith Richards and the Happy Mondays, you know, they were the only sort of contemporary artists I can think of. I mean, I, I guess you know in the '90s there was a big sort of weed culture in in '90s hip hop, but I think today it, it has it it it's, it's really artists are operating very in a clean way um to create you know i think it's it's kind of a different it's a different landscape today i, I know bowie went through a big you know cocaine period in the 70s and says that he said that he couldn't remember recording station to station at all you know so uh, there are artists that have obviously had mega influential records which they've made in a completely altered state but i think on the whole you know people um, operate in, in more of a clean way. They, they get more done in that way. But I think it's the fans actually that are, you know, imbibing and and kind of, you know, enjoying the music as, in a receptive way uh, within the drug culture in society. Um, yeah, no, I'm for sure. I mean, I, I certainly, you know, we've all probably seen the Doors movie and things like that, but, you know, that's a, they sort of, the way it's portrayed in the film, at least, you su it's suggested that he almost like wrote the music and sung the album's, through you know doing various drugs at the time and that was a big part of it and i guess certain eras of music too in certain time periods when it was more prevalent um and also whether you are actually doing drugs or at, at that very moment when you're writing the track or whether you are just doing drugs in general at that point in your life you know so that it's just a part of who you are whether you're clean or not is the interesting thing i mean there's you know the, the whole concept of clean is is really something that's come across, come up in the past decade, right? I mean, that's yeah. something which is a, a new phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, but you know, when I was a kid, I didn't really drink until I was probably about 23, 24. I was, well, I went through college, I was so driven. I was so, you know, because I kind of skipped a year and, and applied to St. Martin's without doing a foundation course. I kind of blagged my way in. And then I was just on this mission to get as much out of the experience as I could and to be creative whilst I was there, because it was, you know, the top the clock was always ticking. And so I, I kind of, um, I mean, I would go out a lot. I would go out to clubs all the time. Um, but, you know, th just sort of being drinking and being out of it wasn't really something that I was pursuing. It was more, you know, the club thing was socializing and going out, going out with my girlfriend, things like that, and hanging out. It wasn't, you know, for, it was more of a networking thing, really, than anything else. And, right. um you know, but I used to go to, I don't know if you remember the Camden Palace, which used to be the old music machine. Um, my friend Rose used to do the door. So I used to go there every Tuesday night through most of St. Martin's. And you'd see a lot of very big pop stars completely out of it in the VIP area. Um, but they weren't recording music when they were doing that. They were kind of, you know, Kim Wilde was going wild, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I heard, um I heard uh, a, actually a fellow Doncaster. Don, what, how do you call it? Doncastrian? Is it Don, Doncastrian? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, Donny. Donny. Castrated. I've got a neighbour here who um, is, is a farmer, and he's from Doncaster. And he he had a birthday party, and he had playing. Um, he had um, Roger Daltrey singing right. at his party, and right. he he did behind blue eyes, and. Um, he well, how Roger told you he's going to be like 70 now, right? I mean, 70 something. 70 plus, yeah. Yeah. So, and after I caught up with him afterwards and I said, I was where I just called him and I said, I mean, how can you sing that song and sound as good, like literally as good, if not better than, than, than when you originally sang it, you know, like 50, yeah. 50 
what, 50 years ago. Yeah. And he, mm-hmm. he just turned around, he had little blue glasses, and he went, I don't drink, I don't smoke. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the big rehabilitating thing. I don't know how much music he's written in a sober state, though. I don't know. I mean, he's still he. They a lot of those heritage artists. When you see them, they do really deliver, though. That's the thing that they you can kind of look at them and say, oh, you know, they're past their prime and, and whatever. But um, a friend of mine used to do live sound for the Beach Boys, and I'm I'm not a Beach Boys fan per se. But they invited me along to go to uh, the, the aquarium in, in Brooklyn, and they were phenomenal. Their sound was phenomenal, yeah. and you know it was. I mean, it's it, not the whole band. Um, actually, I saw them subsequently with uh, Brian Wilson at the Beacon Theatre, and again, they were just amazing. Um, but they they can do it because they stay in shape vocally. They you know they don't yeah. abuse their systems and so on. Zeppelin or so, I, I recently, I don't really do social media, but I couldn't help. Um, the only thing I kind of look at is uh, Led Zeppelin have an Instagram thing. And someone, I, I, somehow I saw it the other day and I was like, oh, and I, I adore, love Led Zeppelin as well. And I started, and I, I look at the, uh, the Led Zeppelin Instagram thing, and it's got these little stories about how Jimmy, how, how, they, how certain tunes that they, they created were made, like as in, You've got producers who are sitting there. I was sitting in the studio with Jimmy and we were listening to this thing over and over again. We couldn't work out um, how, you know, he was just fit. He couldn't get that sort of solo stairway to heaven, you know. And we were sitting there, we were down about, and suddenly the penny dropped. And, and, and it was like, you know, all of his solos, all of Led Zeppelin's solos always happen at the end, you know. And then there's the, and then there's the kind of explanation by this producer of a, you know, of a, of a conversation he had with Jimmy Page about why. You know, they let all the singing and all that stuff go on first and then nail the solo, and, it, and it's kind of formulaic. And you're like, you're sitting there thinking, Jesus, okay. Yeah, that totally, totally was in front of me. I never saw it. And it's so professional, you know. It's just super professional. And it, I think if you're a kind of fucked up rock star, you know, if you get into the recording studio and you're kind of completely wasted, your producer sitting in there, it's a day job. He's going to be like, he's going to try and get the best out of you, but really you know, come back tomorrow, try not to get so fucked up and we'll do it again, you know, get them on a good day. And and, and, and I do think that it's, you know, it's not just about one guy doing it, isn't it? It's a whole collaboration. And yeah. and these guys, you know, if you've got the talents there, if they're pissed or stoned or whatever, it doesn't matter. If you're a really good producer, they can kind of catch, you know, you can just come back and try it again. Or, you know, and if you read, you read that and then set for this kind of thing, the, the process by which they made their music really is just, it was extraordinary. It was like, a, and I've recorded, I've been in recording studios and I have really good producers doing stuff, um, and um, not on your level, but you know, it's much smaller level, but really good producers nonetheless. And good producers get the best out of, of good musicians, right? So, yeah. you know, um, and on it goes. It's clever. It's like what I was saying earlier about the drill stuff. I kind of like you know, you change the drugs because that kind of music that my eighteen year olds listening to. It's just like you know, you haven't been in a room with a bunch of people. You sit there, you know, smoke, roll a joint, smoke a joint. And there's a sort of deafening silence, and you're like, "Well, that was fun." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't like smoking weed, but I mean, you sit there and just go, "Jesus!" I mean, seriously, you know, <laughs> you got home time, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I think one of the big differences uh, today is that r- records are quite often made at home. You know, made in everybody's got a home studio now because of Pro Tools and Logic and even GarageBand. You know, you can get. A, you can get a good sound with a particular kind of music in your spare bedroom, um, but you can't get a Led Zeppelin sound in your spare bedroom because you can't record drums. Um, the, the, the live guitars can't be going through a Marshall stack because you're going to your neighbors are going to go berserk. Um, but you can write, you know, dance music with a pair of headphones on using beats. And the artists are often not thinking about how that's going to be performed live. They're just thinking about making a great record with great beats. Zeppelin were thinking, what's this going to sound like when we're on, you know, at the Fillmore? Um, and they had to think about that because they were a live band from the very beginning before they started recording, as you know. And I think that's a big difference to today. The performance side of it is probably a, a second thought. It's actually just making a record that's going to sound good uh, streaming or sound good in some environment, but without thinking about what what happens when I get up on a stage at Madison Square Garden, how can I make this track connect with with an audience? And will but it? Is that, is that um, 
is that that's interesting actually what you said because was there has there, was there a kind of period about 10 years ago when bands made their money out of recording right and 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 touring was just simply just not you know it was like a unless you were the Rolling Stones you know, it's a loss-making venture. It was, you know, it was like it didn't actually generate the income. Well, maybe 20 years ago, it wasn't generating the income. Um, sure. Th- and now, it seems the tables are completely turned. Now, touring is the kind of, that's where, the, you know, the yeah. money is, you know, that kind of like, you know, losing losing, losing sight of the fact that, hang on a minute, you know, we're going to, in order to promote this thing, we're going to go on tour and, like, hammer yeah. it. And we're going to be able to oh. do it. But do you think it's changed a lot now? It's totally changed. I mean, I, I, it's... um. I'll give you an example. I made a dance record in the mid 80s that gets about 35,000 streams a month, and I get 89 cents for that, right? It's ridiculous, you know. Yet, uh, you can go out and play a small show, you know, with, you know, a couple of hundred people and actually make a bit of money, sell merchandise, you know. But if you're of the the, the level of, I don't know, it, Taylor Swift, for example, or even Sleaford Mods, you know, who are, you know, kind of more underground, you can still go out and, and sleep at Mods play Glastonbury. I mean, for a, for a duo, they're a pretty big act, but they sell a load of merchandise, T-shirts, tote bags, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're supported by that probably more than record sales and certainly more than streaming because streaming is microcosmically small. So I think today when people are making music, um, it's almost a byproduct of how they're going to make a living from it. They're going to make a living through selling merchandise. Um, right. You know, if they can. It's, it's funny because you know when when I was I started making this record a couple of years ago with a buddy of mine, uh, Fabio Fabri, who's based in Italy. He's in Florence and he has a studio in Florence. And I was going there a lot to work, you know, to to teach. And we met. Um, and he said, "Oh, you know, I've got a small studio. Do you want to come and, and make some music?" And you know, we were we were kind of gung ho. So we were doing it for fun more than anything else because you know we know the reality. You're not going to sell anything. Um, but let's do it. It's a great, fun project. Um, and now we've got the album. We've got it released. And, you know, we, we're doing some press and stuff like that. Um, the next thing is to actually get together with, you know, a band and, and perform it live. And that yeah. now is the big challenge, you know, because yeah. he's obviously in Italy. A lot of the other guys that played on it, like Midgeor uh, is in London. Uh, Dave Formula from Magazine is in Manchester. You know, they're, they're all over the place. Um, so bringing everybody logistically together is pretty much impossible. So we have to find other guys to play with, but we have the logistics now of, do we do gigs in, in, in the East coast and Fabio comes here and I get a bass player and a drummer and a keyboardist here and we rehearse a few days and then go out. Or do we go to Italy? In which case I need a visa. He needs a visa to come here. I need a visa to go there to, to, to perform. So it gets, it's really complicated. But how ironic, how unbelievably difficult it is to be a live musician, an actual, an actual talented person to get up there and perform your, whatever it is you're doing, whatever you play or, you know, do your music, perform your music. So it's unbelievably difficult. It's been made, it's punitive. It's been made even more difficult in the last six months in this country. But at the same time, you, me, Nice, we can all click on Spotify right now and we can listen to a tune that's been made out of some Brazilian rainforest pipe music, yeah? I mean, seriously, you know, properly produced, nice tune, and um, the point it's done it is getting what, like half a cent um, for every fifty thousand. I mean, but, it's, it, but it, 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 is it is it not the kind of do we not now have a formula for basically the implosion of of creativity in the music industry? I mean, how 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 how, is it, how, how on earth is this gonna? Where's it going? I mean, where do you see, where do you see it going? It's it's an interesting question, and I think so. There's downsides to the whole digital thing. Obviously, um, and the downside primarily is sales, sales of music. Um, but the upside is the creative collaboration part of it, which we made a record that we recorded. Fabio plays all of his guitars, produces the track in his studio in, in, in Florence. And when I'm there, I do my do the lyrics, do the vocals. And, and then we've got the basics of the track. Then we can send all the stems of that track or the individual tracks to you know, Richard Fortas in the U.S., to put down some guitar lines or we could send them to guys in, in London or in other parts of the UK or other guys in, in other parts of you know, the US and other parts of New York. And we can collaborate really, really well in a, in a very high quality way because of the digital 
um, yeah. uh, possibilities. But so Keenan, in the one Keenan, side, Keenan, it, how you, makes it, how, Keenan, how do you put that together in your head? How do you put the music as a musician? If you if you if you don't have all the pieces, like how do you, as a musician, as from someone like myself who's not a musician, you know, listening to you say that, it sounds like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. Everyone's doing their bit wherever they are, right. and, I, and I know during the pandemic there were various quite big music releases of of sort of big hit songs yeah. that were coming out where the musicians had never even met ever, and they were only put together, and they were, literally the first time it was sort of. It, 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 I guess they were even performing together was on the radio. I heard that on Sirius XM, certain bands yeah. were performing together all virtually for the first time. Yeah. Producing, and the, the songs were great. But how does that, how do you do that? How do you know what uh, you're going to do? I don't know. It's, no, it's, the, question, the thing that Kino was about to get to, and I'm really, this is going to sound super rude, but the, the upside of the digital thing is the ability for all musicians and producers to be able to send stuff and collaborate, talk, and, 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 and make that great music. Yeah, uh, that's upside of the digital thing, but the, the the downside is how to monetize it. I mean, how 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 it is? How, yeah, it's 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 really hard. I mean, I've never worked that out. That's why I've, I've, I don't make a living from music. You know, I, I've for me, fashion was a more surefire way to make a living, and and that's very insecure. Uh, but music, I knew when I was twenty. You know, we went into EMI Studios to to record in Manchester Square. And I knew then that, you know, making a living out of this is going to be really, really hard. But having a lifelong career in fashion, you kind of can do that. You know, um, I think today, again, there's upsides and downsides. You know, Nigel was asking a really, really good question, um, which I think, you know, uh, to answer from my perspective, I don't want to speak for other musicians, but with our most recent recording with this album, uh, I kind of, I hate using this word because it's so cliche, but curated musicians that I knew to play on it. And basically, you know, I would call them up and say, hey, I've got, we got these tracks. Do you fancy playing on a couple? And I would choose the track that suited a particular musician. Um, there's a guy playing on one of our tracks. His name's David Torn, and he played a lot, played on Bowie's last three albums, um, uh, Heathen, uh, Reality Heathen, and, and uh, Next Day. And, um, he had plays a very kind of sort of ambient guitar style. It, it, he doesn't like play melodies per se. I mean, they're very dissonant. I knew he was going to be brilliant on this particular track that we've written, which is called Euphoria, because it would offset the, the nice melody of the track. You needed a bit of counterpoint to it. And so I thought, you know, David Torn would be brilliant. And he's somebody I didn't actually know. My next door neighbor, Mario McNulty, produced... Uh, Bowie's Never Let Me Down re-recorded album in 2018 and he knows David Torn very well and I said to Mario would you introduce us and Mario said yeah sure so then we played David the track and he liked the track and he was willing to play on it um, that wouldn't have been possible you know definitely not 20 years ago I mean it, we just didn't have the sophistication in terms of the technology uh, I've never met David you know Midge you're I know and you know met Midge many times yeah. but okay. definitely 20 years ago, you would have been doing the music. You wouldn't have been what you're talking about. It's not so much curating, I, I would venture, as it, you know, it's the skill producing, right? You're, you're, you're producing and you're just being, it's the sign of a skill producer. You can, you can hear someone's sound and you can think, oh, I know exactly where that's going to go. And then you tease yeah. out the best sound of that thing. I mean, that's just skill producing. Now, you do that online, it's brilliant. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, but what comes first? Yeah. What comes first, I guess, is the question I'm asking is, <clears throat> for example, do you write the lyrics first or do you get a rift in your head? And then how do you know what that next person's going to give you that's going to go along with it that you're going to somehow mix the next piece of music to? And is it all, I mean, I guess there must be just the stages. You must be just adding on, but you can't just do it all together and then add it on at the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we, with this last record, we worked in very different ways. So Fabio had some songs that he'd written. I had some songs that I'd written. Um, he had some songs that didn't have lyrics. And so I would go in and put down a lyric on a song that he already had fleshed out. Some songs that I had had lyrics, you know, completely finished, and we re-recorded them in his studio. And then it was a question of, you know, thinking about, okay, I've got this track. It sounds, uh, you know, a bit kind of psychedelic. I want something to pull against that, you know, because I don't want it to be all in one vein. I mean, what we're doing is very much a kind of retro sound. and You know, we're not doing anything new at all. But, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, who's a guitar player who's going to play a lead on this that's going to really pull against it and actually make it feel new because they're playing a sound that you maybe are not expecting to hear on that type of track. And, you know, I would think of like, 
Richard Fortas, who plays with Guns N' Roses, he has this very kind of LA rock and, rock and roll guitar style. And I thought that could be great on that track because it's completely the opposite of what the track is. And it will really jump out, you know. Um, so it's it's a bit of that. Um, you know, you you called it, uh, you know, production or whatever, but it's sort of having an ear for someone's mm. style yeah. and knowing whether it's going to gel with that track, you know, with that song. Um, and it's tell us, about, just, tell us about this album then, King Boy Vandals. So first of all, the name King Boy Vandals, what, what is that? What does so that come it, from? It's an anagram of Slinky Vagabond. Uh, and it was either King Boy Vandals or Sly, Sly Blonde Vagina were the, two, <laughs> were the two anagrams that I came up with. And so I thought King Boy Vandals was a bit rolled off the tongue a little bit better. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, so, and we take this taken a couple of years to make it. We did all the backing tracks, the vocals and everything before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic happened, that's when we brought in all the guest musicians. And, um, you know, we just, we made it, we put it out ourselves. We made a few videos. Uh, I was in LA and Palm Springs a couple of weeks ago. So we've shot a couple of videos when we were there. And, um, you know, it's all self-produced and self-made and it's just our creative expression. And, you know, Fabio is a good, great mate and he's a very, very talented musician. I think he's an excellent guitarist and a brilliant producer and a pleasure to work with, a fellow Torian. So, you know, we're all kind of earth signs in the mix. And, you know, we've we just made something that we love and we've started making another one now. So, you know, we're kind of just rolling along with it. And is it as well? I mean, obviously you, you alluded at the beginning that you don't really do it for making money. You do it for the love of it is that still yeah. is that still the motivation are you are, are you able to monetize it in any shape or form other than streaming it for a few cents for every hundred thousand streams or what are we you, doing you can you can go out and play gigs i mean we were offered a, we were offered a gig for dentsu advertising agency about a month ago uh which unfortunately fell through but that was to perform online and we could do that acoustic so the two we have a full acoustic set so we could do the whole album acoustically and, um, you know, things like that are real. They're a real opportunity because it's to a thousand odd employees of a company and it's six songs. You know, it, it's uh, you get paid. Um, it's great. I mean, I'm, I'm up for doing gigs. But it's, with not other bands. The same. But it's not the same. It is well, it's not, not the same. same. But it's, it's a live venue in front of a thousand people shouting. Out. Yeah. I mean, it's when we had the first the first incarnation of Slinky Vagabond was myself, Clem Burke from Blondie on drums. Glenn Matlock from Sex Pistols on bass and Earl Slick, uh, who's Bowie's guitarist for the longest time. And we, our first show was at uh, Irving Plaza in New York, supporting the New York Dolls. And I mean, I hadn't played live for a few years. I was kind of crapping myself with that one. You know, we had to go on uh, right before the Dolls and everybody was there to see the Dolls. But it was fantastic. You know, it was, it was a fantastic thing. And the euphoria of playing live is the most important thing. So for me, doing festivals to you know like lower down on the bill or supporting bands is a way to go because the audience is already built in you know i'm not interested in getting up in a bar and playing to five of my friends um and then the next gig is three of your friends and then the next gig is your wife and that's it you know it's it's that's the re the reality of it is you you know you have to be real um you know what i've always done just played my i was about to say play with myself play to myself it's well, it, from, the, from the off you never let yourself down then you know you never let yourself down, but it's like, you know, I mean, I'm very much a realist. I was, I'm always a realist with fashion. You know, I know the, the paradigm uh, of, and the parameters of fashion, you know, there, um, there are limits, there are places you can go with it. And, you know, you're not necessarily going to go further than that. I think if you know, if you understand that in the beginning, um, you, you're kind of not let down and you can work with a sense of reality. I mean, I'm a total optimist as well, so I'm totally going for it. But I do know the reality and, and understand the market as well, you know, understand who's going to want what I can give and why are they going to want it and how many of them are there, you know. And um, it's, I think it's important and I think it's something you, we all get as we, as we kind of get more experienced in life, you know. You understand who you're speaking to as an artist and you kind of know that they're going to connect with what you're doing if it's working within a certain parameter. So, you know, that's that's really what we're trying to do. But we're, we're just trying to have a fun time making this record with our mates. You know, that's basically the bottom line. Where, where is, well, well, I mean, first of all, I, I guess- I'm doing this podcast, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. It's very similar to you and I. Keenan, before we let you go, we've got something called Last Orders on this show, but I'd love to know as well, 
the, the, the actual album available on Spotify, available, I'm assuming Apple Music. It's Google all the Play. streaming, YouTube. Um, you know, we're getting like a lot of views. We had like 5,000 views in a week on YouTube, which was pretty good. When the first single came out, the first single is called The Beauty in You, and it's kind of a ballad, like it's sort of, People tell me it sounds like early, early suede, you know, so it's definitely got a vibe. Um, but yeah, and, and the, we're making a vinyl of the album and a CD that won't be ready until probably October. Um, but, you know, by October, we might be ready to play some shows and that's where you can really sell it. Uh, you know, it's, there's, there's not that many record shops anymore. So, you know, it's... Do people, uh, where do they go? They go to slinkyvagabond.com or keenandufty.com? Or they, they go, yeah, you can go to slinkyvagabond.net is the website. Um, we're, we're on Facebook, we're on all the social media stuff and, um, you know, I'm keenandufty.com for, for my stuff too. Uh, and they can find all the slinky stuff on, on my website. So whatever you can remember, go and check it out there. And guys, when I, when we actually post this particular podcast, I'm going to put all the details in our social media on, uh, at shaken and stirred show, you'll be able to find it. So Follow us along at, at Shaken and Stirred Show. All the information on Keenan Dufty and uh, Slinky Vagabond and his new album, King Boy Vandals, will be there. Now, uh, before we let you go, last orders on a man who doesn't even drink. Um, but here we go. Quite simple, quite easy. Skinhead or long hair, Keenan? Long hair. Really? Yeah. And there's me thinking there was the punk in you, but anyway, you know. No, I long hair. I'm, 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 a, I'm a gender bender at heart. <laughs> There you go. As, as, you, as you saw from that photo. Trust me, I've got pictures that look just like that of me, FYI. <laughs> you know, so there you go. Favourite <laughs> fabric to work with? Well, favourite fabric in a tactile way probably has to be velvet because it's so lush and plush and, you know, luxurious. You really are. Look at you. After all that, you, you, you are a, a glam rocker. I can see it now. <laughs> through and through. Um, in the movie of your life, who would you have play you? Uh, Bob Ross. Bob Ross. <laughs> okay, Bob Ross. It is. Um, what gets your goat and what floats your boat, Keenan? Uh, what gets my goat is uh, loud talkers in public places, on phones more than anything else. And you know what floats my boat is a good vibe, a good atmosphere. Um, you know anything that that's created with a a good record, uh, seeing great clothes, seeing great art. Um, you know, anything that somebody's making a personal expression and it's really honest and true and fun. And here they come. The cops are coming. The, co the cops are coming. They're coming to get you. Finally. They've, the they've fashion police. Up with you. I was worried that it was in my neighborhood. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I, I moved into the country, into the hills on purpose. I was going to hide on the... Oh, Tom's gone. Look at that. He <laughs> lost, we lost him. Oh, wow. There you go. That was Tom. He was being nabbed by the police. We just lost Tom there for a second. Um, final question. Shaken or stirred, Keenan? I think I'm stirred. I think I'm stirred. I think I'm more of a stirred kind of guy. Well, you know, I like to think of myself as stirring as well. Yeah. You know, some of us are, some of us aren't. Tom's definitely <laughs> a shaker. Keenan Dufty, everybody, on the Shaken and Stirred show. Check out his latest album, King Boy Vandals. Um, for, <laughs> it's, the songs are great, actually. I was just listening to one right before I got on with you again. You sent me the album when it first came out, I guess, in earlier this year, uh, and I checked it out. But um, really, congratulations. Slinky Vagabond is the name of the band, um, and you'll be able to check it out on Shaken and Stirred show on our Instagram. We'll have all the links there as well for you to check it out. But um, good luck, Keenan. I hope to see you soon and, you know, catch up in person before yeah, long. Absolutely. Great to see you guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, Keenan. Good pleasure. Meeting. Best Thanks, of luck. Take care, mate. Cheers, mate. Nice. Bye. All the best. Bye. 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 Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken Instead. We will be back next week with another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. See ya.